Good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Why don't we go ahead and shut the door, please, so that uh, we might go ahead and start. I wasn't to be your speaker today. It was going to be a fellow talk, but the, uh, the fellow who was going to give a talk was ill, so, um, and I had this lecture ready because I gave it to the the allergy fellows a couple of weeks ago, so I volunteered to go ahead, and you thought you were hearing about um, eosinophilic lung disease, but instead you're going to hear some stories. What I, I want to do is to approach this a little bit differently. Um, here's my disclosures. I don't think there's anything here that's relevant to our, our talk today. Um, I would like you to, to finish today by understanding a little bit about the differential diagnosis of someone with pulmonary eosinophilia. And in fact, what I'm going to do is to use a technique where I present a case to you, actually a series of cases, and we're going to go through that, and then we're going to develop a differential diagnosis together and um, in doing so learn about eosinophilic lung disease. In, doing, in developing that differential diagnosis, we're going to talk about diagnostic strategies which you might use in these kinds of patients, and um, also to learn about treatment options. I'm going to present several cases to you today. Some of those are Henry Ford cases. Some of those are cases that I've seen in other places. And I'm going to use those as a basis for what I'm going to talk about. So the two cities are here, and in the other city is... San Antonio, and I picked those two cities because I practiced for a number of years in both places, and we're here now, and uh, CHEST this year, and also the SCCM, I guess, uh, is in San Antonio, and so uh, that's another city that some of you might get a chance to visit. I hope so. This is a, a case that you might see here. This is a 21-year-old woman, and she's admitted to the ICU with respiratory failure. She was a healthy person. She had a respiratory infection a week or 10 days ago, and then she had, that seemed to initially resolve, and then she had three days of acute symptoms with cough and shortness of breath and chest tightness. She, uh, on the day of admission, woke up, and she was very short of breath. Uh, she had soaked the bedclothes, and uh, she lived in a house with two roommates, two other young women, and they brought her to the emergency room. And when she arrived in the emergency room, she was very febrile. She was unstable in terms of being tachypnic and had a high respiratory rate. And her oxygen saturation was very low. Her examination was only significant for some rowels on her lung exam. And this is her x-ray. So she presented with an acute respiratory deterioration and a URI before this. Here are some laboratory tests. Um, I use these laboratory tests for a different medium, a different, a different circumstance, and so these are SI units, so don't be misled by that. They're mostly normal. So she had no past medical history. She took no medicine. She was a university student, and she worked part-time as a waitress. She lived in a house uh, in the city with two roommates. No recent travels. She doesn't smoke cigarettes. Uh, she has used marijuana occasionally. She drinks occasionally. Um, so what happened to her? She was started on broad-spectrum antibiotics. She was intubated in the emergency room because of her severe hypoxia. And as you can see, her uh, hypoxia was extreme even after she was placed on a ventilator. The interesting thing was is that her lung compliances were relatively normal. They weren't really too high, um, or the, the pressures weren't very high. Her cultures were negative. Her HIV was negative. Urinalysis was negative. Um, she had a, a tox screen. She had a connective tissue panel. That was negative. All of the blood work, essentially, that was done showed nothing. She had a BAL. And the cultures were negative, but there were 40% eosinophils on the BAL. And this is her CT scan. I'm not going to tell you what she has right now. And I'm not going to ask you either, but I want you to keep this case in mind. And we're going to talk about things that she might have. 
and develop a differential diagnosis for her problem. So the question for you is what's wrong with her and how would you treat her if you know? Keep it to yourself. We'll talk about it later. Um, we'll see. So the second city. This is uh, San Antonio, Texas. This is a hospital where I spent more than a decade working. I was the pulmonary program director at the pulmonary fellowship at this hospital. If you get a chance, when if you go to CHEST, um, I'll try to take you over there, anybody who wants to go. I think it's a wonderful facility. It's an interesting place to see. Uh, in addition to being a program director there for 10 years, for the last four years, I had a, a job as consultant to the Surgeon General. These were the seven medical centers uh, that the U.S. Army had spread around the world, um, from Landstuhl, Germany, to Honolulu, and to a number of places in between. All of these seven medical centers had pulmonary divisions. Their, their program, their service chiefs reported to me for personnel issues and quality and things like that. And in 2004, we had an extramural activity also. Um, there was an invasion of another country, and we had to provide medical support for this. And during the end of the year, I began to hear a few reports of patients, soldiers, who were in the Persian Gulf. And they presented with um, an acute respiratory illness that led many of them to be infiltrated, the, or have to be intubated. The um, x-ray of one of those patients, one of those soldiers, is displayed there for you. And I think the relationship between the way that x-ray looks and the one that I showed you before are similar. Obviously, a differential needs to be developed. There were 18 soldiers over two months, over 13 months in Iraq who had this acute febrile respiratory illness. They had diffuse infiltrates. Their average age was 22. Um, over half of them had to be intubated and placed on a respirator. And about half of them had a BAL done, bronchoscopy, and the average eosinophil count on these BALs was about 40%. So these patients had an eosinophilic lung disease too. And these are cases that I want you to keep in mind also. Andy Shore, who was at Walter Reed at the time uh, and is now at the Washington Medical Center, took the lead on reporting these cases, and they're reported in JAMA, and the, uh, the reference is there for you. I have on the last couple of slides of this lecture all of the references that I'm going to talk about, and so those should be available to you. So what did they have, and what, uh, what kind of things could cause is cinephilia. The image at the top left is a painting, and I saw this painting in the in the uh, in art museum in Madrid. I was walking down a hallway that had a lot of paintings from the 1400s, and these paintings were all very dark and sepia toned. And I came upon this one, and I thought the first thing I thought was that it was completely out of place, um, but it wasn't. It was painted in the mid 1400s. And it was about a woman named Agnes Sorel. And I wondered who she was because it was such a striking painting. So I found out that she was the mistress of the King of France, King Charles VII. And I also found out in reading about her that, um, that there had been um, a number of troubles over the long period of time. She had, been, she had died in the mid-1400s. She had been buried. Her tomb had been raided and moved. Um, historians weren't sure whether she was really in the tomb that was originally assigned to her that they that's, that's talked about. So a few years ago, some, some forensic pathologists excavated the tomb, and the, the picture in the middle is Agnes Sorel today. They were able to prove through carbon dating and DNA and so forth that that was really her. And I thought, interestingly enough, with um, computer-generated imagery, they were able to use the, the um, measurements on the skull and reproduce of what she probably looked like in life, which is the picture that's represented in the upper right, which is, I think, fascinating. In addition to the things that they found in the tomb that related to her, they also found the DNA of another species. And that species was Ascaris lumbricoides. She was, uh, it was said that she had died of something called the bloody flux, and it turns out apparently that the bloody flux may well have been um, related to Ascaris. And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about eosinophilic lung disease that's related to parasites. 
Lossler syndrome is uh, a condition that is related to the transpulmonary passage of helminthic larva. And there are some pictures there not only of Lothler but of Vascaris. Uh, this organism is very common worldwide, and it's a very important cause of pulmonary eosinophilia. There's nearly 800 million people infected worldwide with this organism with large numbers in Asia and it's related to suboptimal sanitation practices. There's year-round transmission in areas with a warm environment. So the life cycle of this organism is that the eggs are deposited in the soil, they become infected in two to four weeks, they hatch in the intestine, the larvae penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate to the lungs and the liver, and uh, then they can produce mature larvae in the alveolus, and ascend and cause pulmonary eosinophilia, which we call Loeffler syndrome. It's peripheral, it, it includes peripheral and pulmonary eosinophilia. An x-ray of a patient with Loeffler syndrome is, is represented here for you. And these patients get shortness of breath, cough, wheezing. Uh, they can have hemoptysis and they may have eosinophilia if you were to do a BAL. Worldwide, the burden of helminthic infection is really striking and important. These are color-coded maps of the range of different organisms and where they may occur. And certainly worldwide, this is an important problem. Does she have Loeffler syndrome? Probably not. She doesn't have, she didn't live in an endemic region. She didn't have any of the signs or symptoms that were consistent with this. But I think if you want to study or learn or know about eosinophilic lung diseases, especially uh, those of us who, who may be in other areas of the world, this, this is an important cause of pulmonary eosinophilia. If you were looking at a, uh, a travel magazine, this would be labeled as the Mojave Desert, but in the military we call it the National Training Center. Um, this was first used for desert warfare training, the Mojave Desert, in World War II and it's still used today, and I have photographs there, obviously, from then and now. But I came across this letter that I thought was really interesting. It was from a physician who was at the Desert Training Center during World War II. And he wrote a letter where he described to a colleague that very suddenly we got a number of men with influenza-like symptoms, bizarre lung findings on physical and on x-ray, and they also had erythema nodosum. And what he was describing was a condition that really had been poorly recognized and not understood before World War II. But with the advent of desert warfare training and with the establishment of airstrips in Southern California and Arizona, there was a huge augmentation, a huge increase in the number of cases of coccidiomycosis that were being reported in the Southwest. Coccidioides imitis is an organism that is in the southwest uh, Sonoran Desert region. And this region extends through Arizona, the Mojave Desert, Southern California, and into Mexico. It is a dimorphic fungus. It exists as mycelia in the soil, and it exists as endospores or spherules in the tissue. And that's very important because the mycelia are the infective agents or the infective form and the spores that exist in the lungs are not infective. So people can't, can't give this organism to each other, but you can give it, get it if you're exposed to it in the environment. Some of you who have trained here and worked here all your life may think this is a rare illness. This is not a rare condition. It's a geographically limited condition. And that's very important to understand. If you go during the course of your career and work in Southern California, Arizona, places like that, you're going to see a lot of coccidiomycosis. And in those areas, it's as frequent as sarcoidosis is here or a number of other illnesses that we commonly see. So it's not a rare thing. The endemic risk is about 3% per year. It happens in the dry season. Most of the cases, most of the patients are subclinical. When they do surveillance with serologies, they find that there's many, many more people who are exposed to it than actually have this disease. Uh, and it usually presents just like in an immunocompetent person like a community-acquired pneumonia. There are activities that are associated with COXI. So people who are involved in sporting activities in the desert, which is a common thing, are exposed to it. Home construction and building construction um, creates a lot of dust in the environment and can predispose people. 
I had at least one patient when I worked in Denver who had visited family in Southern California during an earthquake, and six months later I was diagnosing his coccidiomycosis, which he had contracted while he had been there during the earthquake. So just being in the area during something like an earthquake where there's lots of soil and dust in the air can be a predisposing thing. And of course, military operations are, are, are an exposure at risk too. Coccidiomycosis in terms of its incidence and prevalence seems to be increasing. And this is a graph that demonstrates that. What's not clear is if that increase represents a true increase in disease or if it, increase, or if it indicates an increase or change in the testing and awareness of the disease. Nevertheless, in terms of the incidence that's being reported, there appears to be an increase. And so this is a condition, if you live out there, that you might, might come across. If you don't take care of COXI patients and you've never seen them, then this progression would be unfamiliar to you, but it's important to understand this progression of disease. So the x-ray at the top left is a presentation x-ray of somebody who's immunocompetent and comes in with pulmonary coccidiomycosis. And they will present with an infiltrate that looks for all the world like a pneumonia. And their symptoms may be very, very similar to an acute or a subacute pneumonia. What happens then is that this infiltrate will cavitate. And so you get, I think you can, I hope you can see in the middle picture, this thin-walled cavitary lesion. And that's very characteristic of what you might see happen to this infiltrate after about six months. These, this is not the same patient, but I've seen this progression in patients, and this is exactly what happens. And then over time, what happens is this will consolidate and leave a nodule that will be present. So if you work in California and you have a pulmonary nodule clinic, you will be seeing these patients, and they're all 50, and they all smoke, and they've all lived in Southern California or Arizona all their lives, and you won't know whether this is coxy or cancer. And we, I have been, lived in places where we've taken out lots of coxy nodules because you can't always be sure. But this is the progression of disease that you would see. Um, a picture there of enodosum and what that looks like. And usually when you see enodosum with coccidiomycosis, it happens with the acute illness, and it usually portends a good prognosis. So these are our patients that usually present to you acutely, febrile, sick. They have enodosum. Those patients usually respond very quickly to treatment or sometimes even spontaneously, and they're not the people that you usually have problems with. So flu-like symptoms, arthralgia, enodosum. There's peripheral eosinophilia in about a quarter. Most patients with mild disease don't require disease treatment, and uh, patients with COXI may present with diffuse infiltrates and pulmonary eosinophilia. I've got a reference of that for you, so um, that could happen. I still send my serologies if I really think somebody might have COXI to this guy, because this guy is the world's expert on COXI serologies. He has a lab at UC Davis, and they do very, very reproducible work in terms of COXI serologies. And if you go and look him up on the web, he's got his own website. They've got their own portal for you to send their spe your specimens to him. And they process very rapidly. And I have had set more than one case where I did the serologies for COXI locally, and they were negative, and I had him do them, and they were positive, and the patient had a clinical diagnosis that was consistent with that. So if you really want to know, this is where you send your COXI serologies. There are a couple of types of um, serologies that you can get. You can use screening, which can be IgG or IgM, and then there's an immu immunodiffusion confirmation test for your boards. The number you want to remember is 1 to 16. If the, if the serology, if the complement fixation titer is less than 1 to 16, 1 to 4, 1 to 8, they probably have localized disease. If it's 1 to 16 or higher, they're at high risk to have disseminated disease. And in fact, when I used to practice in an area where I saw COXI, we would just assume somebody with a titer of 1 to 16 or higher had disseminated disease because that's usually how it, how it works out. So who do you treat with COXI? If they have severe disease, if they have more than 10% 
of loss of body weight, night sweats, multi-lobar multi infiltrates. Um, if their CF titer is greater than one, 1 to 16 or symptoms for more than two months, you should think about treating them. And then people who have complicated disease should be treated as well. I looked at one series of patients who presented to pulmonologists in an endemic area. And these are patients, obviously, who are coming to a specialist, which might be you or me, and they're coming with symptoms. So that's a subgroup of patients. But of those patients who came to a pulmonary clinic, about half of them left the day of their visit with treatment. So our colleagues in those areas, when they're seeing a new patient, are treating about half the time. About half of their patients who probably have mild disease and don't require treatment, and about half do. Um, the kind of treatment that you use depends. So fluconazole and itraconazole and the other azoles are useful in treatment. Um, no one, it de how long you treat depends. So if somebody's got mild disease, you're going to treat them for a few months. If it's severe, for a year. And some people who have disseminated COXI, you end up treating them for very, very extended periods of time. If in the, in the unusual cases where you have a patient with COXI meningitis, they may actually have to require intrathecal treatment with amphotericin indefinitely. Um, who do you think about that disease in? Anybody who's got a titer above 1 to 16. So what I used to do is routinely do LPs if their, if their serology was above 1 to 16. Why? Because COXI meningitis is extraordinarily indolent. And these patients will have just mild headaches, and they're not sick in other ways, and you don't know unless you check. So that's who you have to do that in. Did she have Coxy? No. She doesn't live in the right place. Um, with the soldiers in, um, in the Middle East, we obviously wondered, because of their dusty environment, if they had a similar organism that they were exposed to, but we never found that. She wasn't. She didn't have that condition. One of the things that I would encourage you, if you ever think about this disease, Coxy, is to remember that there, the person's exposure can be a little bit remote, so it can be three or six months ago, that they can be in circumstances that might appear innocuous that they might not mention to you. When they were in California, there was a minor earthquake. And there's also been reports of fomites that transmit coxie. So people have ordered cactus or something else from the desert, and they've got it, and they, they got coxie from it. So that's been reported, although it's rare. But I don't think this lady had coxie. So to talk about infections, pulmonary eosinophilia and infections, there are helminthic infections that are associated with pulmonary eosinophilia, and there are non-helminthic infections that are associated also. And I'm not going to talk about all of those infections, but we've talked about a couple of example and categories from that. So who can tell me what town this is? It's not Rotenburg. Not far off, but it's not. So one of the, one of the clues is that yellow truck. So that truck is um, a, a truck that is in Dijon that delivers filo mustard. Um, Dijon is the mustard capital of France. And filo, filo it makes, uh, they've been making, a, they've been using a family recipe and making mustard since 1840. The only way in America to get it is order it from Amazon, not from the yellow truck. And of course, Dijon is the capital of the Burgundy wine region. And um, so this is Dijon. And the reason to show that is because Pascal Fouché and his group at the University of Dijon runs pneumotox.com. And I think they've done this for about 20 years. And um, I think it's a great example of a, of a service who has this project that they've kept going. And if you don't have this app on your phone, you're missing something because it's a wonderful repository of drug information and pulmonary disease. Um, <clears throat> so drugs can cause pulmonary eosinophilia. The common ones are NSAIDs, and when I gave this talk to the allergists, they said absolutely above everything else, NSAIDs is the one you have to think about. There are a group of antibiotics that can do that too, and there's a list for you of drugs where there are more than 20 cases reported that cause pulmonary eosinophilia. This patient was in your ICU. He had something called dress syndrome, and I, you know, the the rash doesn't show up really well on this 
picture, but he had a confluent erythematous rash everywhere. And this is a life-threatening condition. And this, the fellow that we had in the ICU had a life-threatening condition. His was related to hydrochlorothiazide. Um, <clears throat> but there's a characteristic skin eruption to a dermatologist, not to me. And they have eosinophilia. And they can have internal organ involvement, including pulmonary eosinophilia. The drugs that cause stress syndrome are listed to you there on the left, in addition to HCTC, which is what we, we saw. The patients get it two to six weeks post-exposure. They have fever, malaise, the skin eruption, and they have eosinophilia and atypical lymphocytes. And the ALT is often elevated. One of the things about dress syndrome is that multiple internal organs can be involved. <coughs> and so patients can get lung disease with what appears to be a pneumonitis and have elevated eosinophils on their BAL. And this has been well reported with dress syndrome. But there's a variety of other things that these folks can get too, including AIN with eosinophilia or eosinophilic myocarditis. So definitely something to keep in mind and something that we've seen in our own ICU. Uh, in terms of dress, the recovery uh, occurs after weeks to months, and the treatment is to stop offending agents. Of course, we treat them with steroids. Uh, does that make a difference? No one knows, but that's what we do. Here are some occupational exposures to things that can cause pulmonary eosinophilia, too, and all of those things have been reported. Does she have dress syndrome? She, she didn't have any reports of taking any medicines, so I don't think that she does. When I showed this picture to the allergists, they were surprised to see that Lot Strauss was a woman. And I think they were surprised because um, to see one of the eponymous giants of medicine be a woman is something that I think is interesting. And because of that, I actually looked her up a little bit, looked up her biography. She was born in Nuremberg. Um, she is German, and she came to uh, America in 1938. She became the chief of pathology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And she was one of the founders of, probably get the name wrong, the Society for Pediatric Pathology. And they actually have an award that they give out for her. And I found one thing that she said, which I thought uh, was fascinating when she was asked about pulmonary <coughs> residents, she said that they didn't call their, or their, about pathology residents, she said that they didn't say that her, their pathology residents participated in a training program. She said the pathology residents learn and we teach, but we don't train them. And I thought that was an interesting thing. So anyways, she and, and Jacob Churg, who is also a Russian, expatriate in America described Churg Strauss disease, which we'll talk about. I don't think a, a talk about pulmonary eosinophilia is complete without talking about this illness. So there are criteria, which you probably need to know about for things like boards. These are the diagnostic criteria. Asthma, which really is almost invariable, greater than 10% eosinophils on, on white cell, on, on the WBC either a mononeuropathy or a polyneuropathy, a migratory or transient pulmonary opacity, paranasal sinus abnormalities, and a biopsy showing EOS, you should have four of these six to diagnose Church strauss disease. <clears throat> what I was really impressed with when I had looked this up is how long the course of this disease is. It's not something that happens abruptly or suddenly. It's something that is a gradual illness there's a prodromal, prodromal phase that can go on for years. And these patients can have atopic disease, allergic rhinitis, and asthma, which describes about, you know, 25% of the patients I see in clinic. And so I think that's important to recognize that, is that these people often have this condition or a, a predisposing condition for a long time. Then they have an eosinophilic phase where they have blood, eosinophilia and eosinophilic infiltration. And at this point, patients have chest x-ray infiltrates and worsening of their asthma and peripheral eosinophilia. And then they have a life-threatening vasculitic phase. Um, 
with severe vasculitis. So asthma proceeds this condition in 90%. It's present in 90%. It precedes the vasculitic phase by a decade. When the asthma starts getting worse, it's usually an asthma that's poorly controlled with steroids. And if you see someone who has progressive changes, that, that may herald the development of vasculitis. <clears throat> there are other lung diseases that can occur uh, in this condition as well, including infiltrates with eosinophilia, uh, effusions with eosinophilia, nodules and cavities, VTE, of course. So those are things to think about. Other organs are involved, including the upper airway. <coughs> Cardiovascular disease is very important in this group of patients. Half of, them, half of the deaths are related to cardiovascular disease in this group. And so that's something to attend to. Two-thirds of them have skin lesions. So they have nodules or ulcerations, as I've shown you. And there are other organs involved as well. So it's a multi-system disease, which when it you get the form through, there's, it's terrible. Some other points about this are that the individual manifestation can occur in isolation. So you can get one thing happening and then another and followed by another. The lungs are not always involved, although, as I said, virtually all patients have asthma. Clearly, we talked about how the time course can be very long. If this occurs in pregnancy, um, in those small series where this has been studied, the fetal mortality rate is elevated. And I have seen at least one patient that I thought had this condition in association with leukotriene receptor antagonists, and that certainly has been reported. There's some controversy whether the syndrome that you see in these patients is really due to the leukotriene receptor antagonist or whether in some way that drug causes this to come out or, or develop. So that's not clear, but I've seen one patient like this, so it's to think about. There aren't any specific tests. Um, peripheral eosinophilia is common. So what you're going to read about if you're reading for boards is to know about ANCAs <coughs> in this disease. The ANCA is not universally positive. It's only positive in 30 to 60 percent. And when it's positive, it's usually, but not invariably, the P-ANCA that's elevated or positive. Uh, the BAL typically shows the eosinophilia, and MRI may be useful for the cardiac disease. So I think I would remember the ANCA positivity points for this disease. This is a, a score that I came across that I think is probably pretty useful. It's called the five-factor score. And you get one point for each factor, and or you get you can get one point for each factor. And the only scores, the only total scores you can have are zero, one, and two. So, glucocorticoids are the treatment for this disease. If they have a score of two, they should get cytoxan. <coughs> if they have a score of one, you should consider it. And then there are other di diagnoses that you need to rule out if you are considering this condition. So I think the five-factor score, age, cardiac disease, GI, renal with a creatinine over 1.7, the absence of ENT, the presence of ENT findings is actually a good finding. Um, those are the important elements to that score. Does she have Churg-Strauss disease? She never had asthma. She's probably the wrong age group. She doesn't have a clinical syndrome consistent with that, really. This is the London Chest Hospital. For a number of years when I was in San Antonio, I thought this place was the only place where they diagnosed this disorder. <coughs> but the disorder I'm going to talk to you about next is one that I've seen here, so that's not true. Um, in 1952, ABPA was first described by Hinson at the London Chest Hospital. And I thought this was great. This, the picture is from, his, from their article. And so they don't have photographs or electron micrographs. These guys actually drew what this looked like under the microscope. And that, those are their drawings, what aspergillus looked like. They described a complex hypersensitivity reaction to aspergillus fumigatus. And um, they described it. It's been described, of course, in patients with asthma and cystic fibrosis. And 
a preferred term might be allergic bronchopulmonary mycosis, and I think it's important to think about that because there are other organisms besides Aspergillus that have been a, f associated with this condition, and I think that's worth knowing also. So there's actually a number of Aspergillus syndromes, which we're not going to talk about except for ABPA today, but there's overlapping elements of these. So this is a patient that was in our ICU, and this is a young lady who was pregnant with asthma. She had asthma as a predisposing factor. She came in with status asthmaticus. She, when she was stable at baseline, had this spirometry, which I think you would agree to with me shows obstruction, but is not terribly deranged. But when she came in with status asthmaticus, she was intubated. We had her on low tidal volumes. Her peak pressures were incredibly high, um, 50. She had auto peep in the 15 to 20 range, and she was like that for a week uh, on 100% with lung compliance like this with asthma, and she just wouldn't break. So we did some testing. On the left, you see the criteria for ABPA. She had asthma. We um, checked her IgE level, which was over 1,000. Her eosinophil count was very, very high. And she had specific IgE to Aspergillus fumigatus, so she met two other criteria here for ABPA and the total eosinophil count as well. And she also had some evidence on radiographs of findings consistent with that with some bronchiectasis and mucus plugging. So she met all of the criteria for ABPA, and we gave her steroids. She was pregnant, so she lost her baby, and she ultimately survived. She came back to see me in the clinic, and I talked to her about the treatments for ABPA, and one of those treatments is voriconazole, which we started for her. But the treatments that have been used are antifungals, steroids, and Zolaire. This is from a chest article from this month, and I thought that it was interesting to present this data because what these guys did, and actually a very nice study, was they compared glucocorticoids with itraconazole. <coughs> and what they found was that they were both effective. So if you look at the time to, to the first exacerbation, the, the two populations, the two groups, were nearly the same. However, there was more rapid resolution of the IgE and a composite score, a score that included IgE and some other things, more rapid resolution in the glucocorticoid group. So it appears that this drug is effective in ABPA, but in terms of rapid resolution with treatment, that glucocorticoids might still be preferred. And I think this is, a, and, and the groups were pretty large. There were probably 100 patients in each group, so it's, a, it's an article worth looking at. About using them together, no. So, I mean, it was an article where they were comparing both. Now, I will tell you a couple of things. One thing is that I kind of do believe in the rules of thirds. So, my asthma patient got her problem when she was pregnant. And um, she had had two serious life-threatening asthma events before when she had been pregnant. So part of my counseling to her was that her asthma was likely to be terrible when she got pregnant, and pregnancy was not a good idea. Um, I also talked to her about voriconazole, and probably something that you should remember for pulmonary boards is that it's a ter it's, it's associated with birth defects. It's a highly teratogenetic agent. And so I told her that she absolutely should not use this agent and, and without a plan not to get pregnant. That was our contract. So her first follow-up visit with me, of course, she was pregnant again on voriconazole, which she hadn't stopped. She hadn't called me in the meantime. I was horrified. Um, and the next line of treatment, Zolar, I said, we're not going to do that because... I don't know what you're going to do <laughs> with your treatment. Does this lady have ABP? I don't think so. Yes, sir. How long will you, how long will you actually give them a fungal therapy? I don't know, and I'm not sure anyone knows. I, all I know, I think the best, the, really the best data recently comes from this article, and you can see they treated for a couple years, so I think that's okay. I think it's an indefinite treatment. Um, 
I know that what most people do and what I have done is follow IgE levels, you know, and watch them come down. But I don't know how long you treat or how long it's good to treat for because none of the series are that robust. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, the few I've treated with Boriconazole, I start running into trouble with insurance companies, so I'm not going to pay I'm sure that's true. <coughs> now, most of the past articles, like <coughs> this stuff at Mayo Clinic, they're a little series that they run. They say four months with Intraconazole. And right. They just kind of leave you hanging after that. Absolutely. They don't know. Right. So I don't think any of us know the answer to that. So does she have ABPA? I don't think so. So what does she have? She has this, is what I believe. Um, she has acute eosinophilic pneumonia. This is a rare disease. It was first described in 1989. Um, I wrote a seat question about this, and my colleagues at the seat board said, make sure you mention it's a mimic of arts. So I'm, I'm saying that here, and I'm saying that in my description of the seat question, too, and maybe you'll see that on the boards if you're taking it the boards, is they'll dress it up to look like an arts case. Um, <clears throat> most patients are in their 20s to 40s. The duration of illness is short. They usually have cough, dyspnea, and fever, and two-thirds may require mechanical ventilation. Uh, the febrile illness is usually of a short duration. These patients have hypoxemic respiratory failure. They have diffuse infiltrates. They have a BAL count over 25%, and their peripheral count may be normal. And they have the absence of the other causes of pulmonary eosinophilia, which I hope I've convinced you we've ruled all of them out today for this lady. The disease is severe in terms of its extent. If you get a biopsy, which we usually don't, it shows diffuse alveolar damage with lots of eosinophils and type 2 hyperplasia. <coughs> type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, there's no granulomas and there's no hemorrhage. That's a section of one of the patients. So how do, well, how do people get this? I think the most classic descriptor of how you get it is being exposed to tobacco smoke. And usually what the story is, is it's somebody who's never smoked who starts smoking, somebody who previously smoked who resumes smoking, or somebody who markedly increases their smoking habit. And those changes in a smoking habit often herald um, this disease. There were reports um, from Dave Prezant's work in the World Trade Center of firefighters getting acute eosinophilic pneumonia following their exposures there. Uh, you've heard the combat personnel story. We've talked about that. Marijuana has been ex talked about. Firework smoke has been reported in environmental factors. So what happened to the soldiers? The best we can see is this happened to the soldiers. They were deployed in, a, in an austere environment in a combat situation and some of the young people who previously either hadn't smoked or hadn't smoked very much were smoking a lot. And as best we can tell, that seems to be the risk factor for the soldiers that I presented to you as to why they, they got this condition. Why did our young lady get the condition? Turned out she had a new boyfriend. And she was doing something with her boyfriend. She was going to hookah bars. And so hookah exposure has been talked about as being a risk factor for AEP. And it's something to think about. And there's an article in chess in your references from 2016 that talks about the different types of smoke exposure that have been associated with AEP. And it's a useful article to read. So whether you roll your own, whether you use a hookah, interestingly enough, e-cigarettes have been associated with AEP. So that's something to remember. Marijuana smoking also. Um, <coughs> all of those exposures have been reported to be associated with AEP. Our patient was treated with steroids and was completely better in two weeks. And so that's that story. So what did, what did we not talk about? We talked, I didn't put some of these conditions in because they were rare or they maybe didn't fit my differential. But I have a few remarks about some of these, and I'd like to share them with you. So chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is a rare condition. Uh, it usually is at least four to six months of symptoms before it gets properly diagnosed. These patients have shortness of breath and cough and fever. They usually have peripheral eosinophilia. Their PFTs can be normal or obstructive or restrictive. Their chest x-ray is 
photographic negative of pulmonary edema, right? And the BAL shows the eosinophilia. And so you should remember those things. You treat it, of course, with steroids. There have been reports with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia of using Zolaire. Um, the hyper eosinophilic syndromes can either be primary, secondary, or they can be idiopathic. The primary ones are usually um, myeloid linked in the stem cells. There's usually an eosinophilia uh, or an eosinophilic precursor that is associated with that. The secondary types are due to changes in cytokines, either parasites or other neoplasms, and they're usually polyclonal. So the primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes are monoclonal, and the secondary are polyclonal. polyclonal. The uh, other conditions, I'm not going to talk about hypersensitivity pneumonitis or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or graft-versus-host disease because I think those would be entire lectures in themselves or lung allograft rejection. There are some very rare neoplasms that have been associated with that also. And then my references. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about a differential diagnosis of eosinophilia. One of the things I'd point out is who is it? San Antonio for critical care? Anyone? So this is not a festival in San Antonio. This is what San Antonio looks like on Saturday night all the time. Okay, if, you ha if you're down at the convention center and in a hotel at the convention center, when you walk out of your hotel, the picture in the upper left-hand corner is what it looks like. Um, this down at the lower left is... Um, the Arneson River Theater, so during the summer months they have productions there, and you can sit on the river walk, you can walk up and down this and see that. On the bottom right is La Villita, which is a small area next to this river walk area where they have artisans and shops, and so you can go in there and walk around. It's a wonderful place to visit. First week of October, the weather will be great, and uh, if you go there, I'm sure it'll be a good time. So, a river walk on an empty stomach. If you, if you start, you won't finish that way. <laughs> so thanks.